of his skirt. Seems 
It was back mid-October that we finished our study of Isaiah, and then rather than jump right into the book of Jeremiah, we took a break, and we spent eight weeks studying the subject of worship, and tonight we're going to return to our journey through the Old Testament, and we're going to call this series in Jeremiah, Messages to a Backsliding Nation, and you're going to find that the book of Jeremiah um, it's almost as if it could be read to 21st century Americans. This is going to be one of the most applicable uh, prophetic books that we've read in a long time. So if you've been here at Calvary Greer for any period of time, you know that whenever I start a new book of the Bible, I normally will take an entire service and do an introduction and an overview of what we're about to study by using a method that I've developed called the five A's. And we're gonna to spend tonight looking at the author, the audience, the atmosphere, the agenda, and then we'll end the night with an application. These are the five A's that I try to take you through every time we open a new book of the Bible to make sure that we get kind of an overview and an understanding of where we're going in this book. So why don't we do this? Grab your Bible, look down at Jeremiah chapter 1, 
and we will lay a foundation for our study tonight with the first three verses. And so this is what Jeremiah writes. He says, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Let's stop there. That's our introductory texts here. And we're going to begin by looking at the author. And I know everybody knows that the author of this book is Jeremiah. But we're going to get a little bit deeper into that. Notice verse 1. Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. Now the exact meaning of Jeremiah's name is disputed. In Hebrew, it would be pronounced Yer, here we go, this is a hard one, Yer Meyehu or Yer Meyah. That's how you would pronounce it in Hebrew um, with a New Mexican South Carolina twist on it. So, but the meaning is disputed. Uh, some scholars say that it means Yahweh establishes, and if you know the book, that absolutely fits. Some scholars say that his name means Yahweh exalts, and that can hold water too if you study it out. But I'll tell you my favorite one is the third one, that Yahweh hurls down. Some people say this is translated Yahweh throws. The idea is that through Jeremiah, God is going to be throwing down his judgment upon the nation of Judah. His father, notice here in verse 1, was a man named Hilkiah, and his hometown was this small village about three miles northeast of Jerusalem called Anathoth. And if you say, hey, that, that sounds a little bit familiar from my Old Testament reading, that's because Anathoth was part of a group of cities and villages that Joshua gave to the descendants of um, Aaron, the priest, and it was a priestly city. If you remember that the Levites, when the Jewish people were receiving their inheritance of land in Canaan, or in the promised land, we should probably call it the promised land, that the, um, I just totally went blank, the priestly family, the Levites, thank you, the Levites received no inheritance of land. God says that he was their inheritance, that the ministry was the inheritance, so what happened is that each of the other tribes, when they got their inheritance of land, they took specific areas and fields and cities and villages and they gave them to the priests and to the other Levites who served them in the ministry. It was part of their offering. And so Anathoth was a priestly city. The men of that village were priests and so Jeremiah was the Old Testament equivalent of what we might call a pastor's kid. His great-grandfather was a pastor, and his grandfather was a pastor, and his father was a pastor, which means that he was going to be a pastor, right? A priest in the temple. The interesting thing is because of his age, we don't have any record of him serving in the priesthood. He wasn't old enough to yet serve in the priesthood. And then God comes along and shows that God has another plan for his life. Look now at verse 2. Jeremiah is speaking of himself. He says, to whom the word of the Lord came. So Jeremiah says, I was part of a priestly family, and then the word of the Lord came to me. And we don't have to guess what God said when he spoke to Jeremiah, because jumping down to verse 4, we have the record of what God said to Jeremiah. Notice verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. We're going to camp out here for a minute because there's some pretty important things here. Long before 
Jeremiah was ever conceived in his mother's womb, I want you to see here that God had a very specific plan for him and for his life and for his ministry. Jeremiah was going to be God's mouthpiece primarily to the southern kingdom of Judah, so very similar to Isaiah's ministry. But what we're finding is that later on, Jeremiah is also going to have a secondary ministry to the surrounding nations. So he's got a much bigger ministry than maybe just to the Jewish people. And so we see God speak to him. And before we look at Jeremiah's response to God's call on his life, I want to talk about three undeniable truths that we find here in verse 5. So if you're into apologetics and people are talking to you about the sanctity of life and when life begins and the issue of abortion and these other types of things. This is a great text because the first of three things that we find here in verses 4 and 5 is that the conception of every child, and this is important, regardless of the circumstances of how that child was conceived, is ordained by God. And you can say, well, where do you see that? Notice here, God says to Jeremiah that he is the one who forms every child in his mother's womb. Children are knit together in, his mother's, in their mother's womb by the Lord. And then the second thing I want to show you here, this is fascinating. The Hebrew word translated new, and notice here that uh, the Lord says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That word new is the same word that's used all over the scriptures to talk about a man who knows his wife intimately and the result of that is a child. It's talking about the most intimate relationship and the most intimate knowledge of another. And what we see here is that every created being, before it's knit together in its mother's womb, God knows that person, knows them intimately and has a relationship with them. And you may say, well, so are you saying that like souls exist in heaven before they're sent down to earth? No, we're not getting into any of that. What we're talking about is the fact that God lives outside of time. And so we think of the fact, like for instance, I was born January 23rd, 1967. So you go back nine months and you say, okay, that's when I was conceived. And that's when I came into being. But to God... He's not bound by time. So on January 23rd, 1967, minus nine months, God didn't all of a sudden go, hey, there's this guy Randy that's going to be born. God lives outside of time, and so he has intimate knowledge of and intimate relationship with because he's outside of time. So when God says to Jeremiah, listen, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I knew you, he didn't say I knew about you or I was thinking about you. God is saying, as my creation, I I had relationship with you before you were created. Isn't that kind of mind-blowing? The the whole idea of God living outside of time, it really blows my mind in a number of things. But look at the third thing. God also says to Jeremiah here, he says, before you were born, I sanctified you. Let's talk about that word sanctified. It means set apart. And the exact Hebrew word that's used here means set apart exclusively for God's use. It's the same word that refers to the Sabbath being set apart. The Sabbath is for the Lord. It belongs to him. It's the same word that's used of some of the vessels used in the temple worship that were to be used for nothing else. Like, for instance, maybe some of those cups and things that uh, Belshazzar drank wine out of and toasted other gods, those things were supposed to be sanctified to the Lord. God says to Jeremiah, before you were born, I completely and exclusively set you apart for my use. And so God is saying to Jeremiah, I've got this plan for you, and it's a perfect plan. And I think as we look at that, we need to remember that that every person that is conceived and that is supposed to be born onto this earth, God has a plan for them. 
And so Jeremiah 1 clearly reveals to us God's view of the sanctity of life. And Jeremiah 1 clearly speaks to us why abortion isn't God's will. Like oftentimes people will say, well, you know, I've read the whole Bible and I just really can't make my mind up on this whole sanctity of life thing or where I stand on abortion or something like this. Jeremiah has just made it so clear to us in the words that God spoke to him. And this is one of the reasons why we're involved in our Mercy's Choice ministry to the abortion clinic here in Greenville. And our goal is not to go down there and to condemn people. Our goal is to go down there and to minister to people and to maybe help them make a different decision than what they were going to make regarding ending a pregnancy. Or some of them who have already made that choice, and it is a life-altering choice. Our goal is to be able to minister God's grace and healing to them. A lot of people go into an abortion clinic really having no idea how big of a thing this is going to be in their life. And they think, it's just, I'm just going to, you know, create some convenience in my life. And then afterwards, both the man and the woman find that there's a huge, huge gaping hole in their life. And they begin dealing with emotional stress and stuff. And so we really want to be there to try to minister, and I'm really encouraged that our church has shown such a strong support for that new ministry. I want to go now to verse 6. We're still talking about the author. It's Jeremiah, and we see his response to God's call here in verse 6, and this is going to be extremely applicable to all of us. Jeremiah is telling us how he responded when God called him, and Jeremiah says here, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. So as soon as Jeremiah hears God's call upon his life, he immediately responds by kind of superimposing his own weaknesses over God's call. And a lot of people do this. He made two excuses if you look here at verse 6. First of all, he basically said, I'm not an eloquent speaker. He says, Behold, I cannot speak. He didn't mean he was mute. He means that he didn't have the gift of public speaking. That's basically what he's saying. And then the second thing, he says, for I'm a youth. He's basically saying I'm young and inexperienced. Uh, Scholars don't agree because we're not given the time of his birth. But looking at his life, most scholars agree that he was probably about 15 years old at this time. Very similar to Daniel when Daniel was taken into Babylon and his ministry began. Now, We want to look at this from a couple of different uh, perspectives here. And I know that those of you who consider yourself Bible students, you know that this is a very common response when God calls someone to speak on his behalf. Let's think about Moses. Let's look up on the screen here. Exodus chapter 3. God has called Moses to speak. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And then chapter 4, verse 10, then Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And then later God tells him, listen, Moses, who is it that gave you a tongue? Who is it that gave you a mouth? It's me, and therefore I want you to use it for me. And then, then there was Gideon. Look up at the screen, Judges chapter 6, verse 15. God has called Gideon, and now Gideon says, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. One of the things that we see in people throughout the scriptures who were called to speak for God is that they superimpose their weaknesses over God's call. But you know what? There's also something here that I want to talk about because how many of us have superimposed our weaknesses over God's call and still ended up in ministry? Yeah, amen. God has his way, right? I will tell you that the example we're looking at in Jeremiah and in Moses and in Gideon is the example that I would rather see when a person begins feeling called to ministry. 
I love it when someone comes to me and says, Pastor Randy, I just, and God has been speaking to me, and he's really, really got my attention. I believe God is calling me to go do ABC, XYZ, and will you pray for me because I'm freaking out. I don't know how I'm going to do this. How do you do it? And, you know, there's this humility involved, and I really, really think that that's the way that ministry is supposed to start. It's supposed to start with the humility where God comes and he says, I've got this great opportunity for you. And we look at it and we go, I am a bit excited about that, but Lord, obviously you don't know me very well. I don't, right? And then it kind of goes like that. You can't even get the words out to go back and tell God, I don't know what to do. But I'll tell you that over the years, my experience when people have come to me and they've got that heart, there is a future in ministry for them that is just going to be amazing because they don't walk up basically with the credentials card. Hello, Pastor Randy, it's my first time here at Calvary, and if you ever need a guest teacher, let me know. You know, I want to read a story to you. For years, I've been reading uh, a daily devotional by Pastor Ray Bentley. Ray Bentley pastored the Calvary Chapel called Maranatha Chapel in San Diego County, Ray's been a part of the Calvary Chapel family since almost the beginning, and what an amazing, fruitful life. And Ray is just a sweet man, humble, extremely gifted, fruitful. Last Tuesday, due to complications of COVID, um, Ray went on to his reward, and he's now with Jesus. He went home before anybody expected, and he left a great legacy There's a church in California right now mourning the loss of their pastor. But last week, just before Ray went home to be with the Lord, I was reading the morning devotional that he emails out. And I'm going to read this to you because it's the opposite of what we've been reading in Jeremiah and Moses and Gideon. Let me read this story. It says, a guy comes into a church, says he wants to serve God and is available. What can he do? And then Ray pipes in and he says, this once happened at our church. And the most pressing need at the moment was to get the front sidewalk swept before the evening service because the sidewalks were a mess. The guy reluctantly took a broom. He did a half-hearted job, thanked us for the opportunity to serve, and he left. And Pastor Ray says, we had no intention of insulting this man. So later we talked with him, and he admitted that his attitude was pretty unservant-like. He said, I was fuming. I tell you guys, I want to serve the Lord, and someone hands me a broom, thinking to myself, I pay people to sweep my sidewalks. Do you guys know who I am and how much money I have given to this church? But the guy says, I just didn't get it at the time until later when I began to understand the nature of Jesus. And now Pastor Ray starts writing again. He says, picture Jesus as he lived, touching the lepers, the lame, the unlovely, healing the sick and befriending the poor. Jesus dined with sinners. Jesus ministered to prostitutes. Jesus was surrounded by clamoring throngs of people who wanted to touch the hem of his garment. Jesus walked Jesus walked amongst humanity, not afraid to get his hands dirty or to pour love into their lives. God loves us, God woos us, and God pursues us. This was part of God's great pursuit, denying himself the power of the Godhead, the glory of heaven, and becoming one of us. He denied himself to love us so that we can deny ourselves to love him back and in turn, to love others. And I don't think that Jeremiah was saying, Lord, I'm not willing to serve. Jeremiah was saying, Lord, you've called me to something much bigger than I think I can serve. And God says, you know, that's an attitude I can work with. A guy walking up and saying, do you know who I am? God says, that's not an attitude I can work with. So there's a lot of really good stuff here about how to approach ministry. God's fourfold response to Jeremiah's excuses comes in verses 7 through 10. So Jeremiah gets called, Jeremiah gives his excuses, and now God gives Jeremiah four things. He said, listen, here's my response to your excuse. The first one here is found in verse 7. But, but the Lord said to me, 
Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. And so picture God saying, Jeremiah, I want you to forget about your age. I want you to forget about your lack of experience. I'm sending you out with my authority, and I'm sending you to whoever I choose, and each time I send you, I am going to give you the message that I want you to share. And then we get to the second part of God's response. Verse 8, he says, Don't be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Oh, that's comforting. Isn't that comforting? Understandably, Jeremiah was afraid for his personal safety. He understood that the people that God was calling him to go speak to were not going to be receptive to the message. He, he understood what was going on in Judah at the time, and he knew that God was calling him to confront a backsliding nation that hadn't responded to the warnings of Isaiah. They hadn't responded to the warnings of Hosea. They hadn't responded to the warnings of Micah. And now Jeremiah is like, okay, so I'm going to go speak to them. What are they going to do to me? And God just basically says, Jeremiah, you're going to face opposition, and I'm going to be with you. And it's interesting because when we get to chapter 11, we'll get to the beginning of the opposition, and then that opposition turns to persecution, and it even turns to physical harm. And yet in the midst of that, Jeremiah was faithful. The third part of God's response comes in verse 9. Notice it says here, Then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And so God is telling Jeremiah, he says, you don't need to worry about what to say or how to say it. He says, I've touched your mouth. I've, I've cleansed you. I've purified you. And I've given you the ability to speak my words to the people. So, so every little uh, excuse that Jeremiah made, God comes back and he says, listen, you can make an excuse, but, but let me tell you, I've got everything you need to fulfill your call. And then the fourth of God's responses is found in verse 10. And he says, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. God is summarizing not only Jeremiah's message, but his ministry. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of words here. God says, I have set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. These are words that like you and I would say, um, if I was addressing one of you and I said, okay, you're coming to work here at Calvary Chapel Greer, you're in charge of, this is the authority you have, and you're going to have these people under you. God is saying to Jeremiah, I am commissioning you to a high-level oversight position of the nation and of some of these other surrounding nations. That's amazing. God's saying, I've called you. You are the man. You're going to have the authority. You've got my backing. But it's interesting because God's telling Jeremiah, I'm going to give you a message of judgment, and I'm going to give you a message of blessing to both nations and kingdoms. And then God uses two metaphors here in verse 10 to describe Jeremiah's mission. The first, he compares Jeremiah to a farmer, and he says, Jeremiah, first you're going to uproot. So this talks about announcing judgment. And then he says, then you're going to plant blessing. He says, you're going to go into the nation and to the nations, and you're going to dig up the, the weeds, so to speak, and you're going to plant something fruitful. And then he compares Jeremiah and his ministry to an architect. And God said that Jeremiah would first tear down, which means to destroy and overthrow. That's judgment. And then that he would build. He's going to pronounce blessing. So it's, it, God says, listen, if you don't understand the analogy of the farmer, then maybe a, a construction worker. You're going to go and you're going to demo a building, and then you're going to rebuild a new building. He says, Jeremiah, this is your call. And this is what I'm going to have you do. And, and so there's an application here. And then we'll go on to look at the audience and the atmosphere. 
Having looked at Jeremiah as the author of this book, we learn that God doesn't recruit prideful or arrogant or self-assured people to serve him. He, he usually calls those that are filled with humility. And then he equips them with his word and assures them of his presence, his power, and his protection. Pastor Chuck, Chuck Smith, who was the man that God used to birth the Calvary Chapel family of churches back in the 60s, Chuck had a lot of little phrases that he used. And one is, is he said, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And, you know, obviously any little analogy breaks down if you put it under too big of a microscope. But the idea, what, what Chuck is communicating is as you look at biblical characters, you know, there's a lot of people who could say, Jeremiah was just, not at all the right guy for this job. And God says, oh no, Jeremiah was the right guy because he had a heart of humility. He didn't come to God and say, all right, God, here I am. You know, do, do with me what you will. And you sure are lucky to have me on your team. He came and he basically said, God, I don't know what I could do for you. And God says, perfect, perfect. Just trust me, I'll give you everything you need. So one of the things I hope for everybody in the room, everybody that's watching online, whoever's watching this, maybe years after we were here tonight, I pray that we're in that place that Jeremiah was, was at, that we're filled with humility, but we're also willing to serve the Lord with what he gives us. We're going to see at the end of the study that the world needs that. So Jeremiah is the author, and in verses 2 and 3, Let's look at the audience and the atmosphere. Jumping into verses 2 and 3 again. It says, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign, came also in the days of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captives in the fifth month. Now, I get to summarize that for you because you're reading that and you might be going, what? Just a list of kings. Jeremiah's audience were the people of Judah living in the 40 years prior to their fall to Babylon. This is what we just read. We read a, chrono a chronological list of kings that served over a course of about 40 years and the end of that is the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. And so one commentator wrote, look up at the screen, screen, these are powerful comments. One commentator said, by divine design, I didn't make the slides, did I? By divine design, it was Jeremiah who was called to prophesy in the darkest hours of Judah when Judah as a nation died. And then another commentator said this, God commissioned Jeremiah to oversee the death of his nation. Those are powerful words. And so the audience are the people of Judah living there in Judah in the final 40 years before the Babylonians came in and conquered them. So the audience is closely tied to the atmosphere. Let's talk about the atmosphere. What was going on among the audience? And if you want to do this later, you can get all of the details of this time period by reading 2 Kings chapters 22 through 25. You'll get all of the names and you'll get all of the details, but I'm going to stick to most of the things that Jeremiah wrote here in verses 2 and 3, and then I'm going to add a few details. So listen closely. As I said a couple of minutes ago, Jeremiah ministered during the last 40 years of Judah's history, and it says here from the 13th year of Josiah, that was 627 BC, to the destruction of Jerusalem and beyond, that would have taken place in 587 BC, and then Jeremiah would have been carried off to Babylon. He lists the kings whose reigns he served under in verses 1 through 3 here. These were the last leaders of the once prosperous kingdom of Judah. And it starts with, notice, Josiah. And we know that Josiah was a godly king. He died about 608 BC, and it was during his reign that the law was found. Remember, they were doing some work on the temple, and another guy, I think his name was Hilkiah also, he found a copy of the law, and he brought it to 
the king, and all of a sudden there's this revival in the land. There's this return to the word of God. And the nation went through a national revival, but it was short-lived because the leaders that came after him had a very different view. They didn't continue to uphold what Josiah had brought into the nation spiritually. Uh, Josiah, let's see, let's see, after him came a guy named Jehoahaz. He's not in the list here because he reigned only three months, and so Jeremiah doesn't mention him. Next came Jehoiakim. He reigned from 608 to 597. He was a godless man. He was a terrible king. And he did his utmost to persecute Jeremiah. In fact, it was he who burned the scroll of Jeremiah's prophecies in Jeremiah 36. You can read that later. But he, he went as far as burning the word of God as Jeremiah was writing his prophecies. After him is a guy named Jehoiachin, and there is going to be a test on this before you can get out of here tonight. You're going to have to recite all these names to me to get out the door. We had Jehoiakim, now we have Jehoiachin, but he too reigned only three months, so Jeremiah doesn't uh, include him. He was taken captive to Babylon. And then the last king comes along, and his name is Zedekiah. He reigned from 597 to 586 B.C., And he was the king, you don't ever want to go down in history like Zedekiah, he's the guy who's credited with presiding over the ruin of the nation and the capture of the city of Jerusalem. And his end was not so good. When he realized that the Babylonians were going to mistreat him, he fled. Some people went with him. Nebuchadnezzar captured him. And Nebuchadnezzar was so cruel that what Nebuchadnezzar did is he murdered Zedekiah's two young sons before his eyes. And then he plucked out Zedekiah's eyes so that the last thing he would ever see here on this earth before losing his eyesight was the murder of his two young sons. That's how brutal Nebuchadnezzar was. And so he was then carried off to Babylon where he died. And so we've, we've talked about the author, we've talked about the audience, now we've talked about the atmosphere where Judah is just going downhill spiritually. It started with this revival under Josiah, and year after year, king after king, leader after leader, just leads Judah down this road of idolatry and turning their back on God. But here's a couple of comments that I cut and pasted out of a commentary that I want to read to you. It says here that the prophet Jeremiah lived to see his beloved nation, excuse me, Judah, go from revival to sin, to war, and then to judgment. And yet through all of this, Jeremiah was faithful to preach God's word throughout all the lands for 40 years with no recorded fruit to speak of. Anybody in here ever served in ministry and quit because you just weren't seeing any fruit? I've quit more because I just feel like I gave a bad Bible study. Every once in a while, I'll call Kelly on the way home, and she'll say, you coming home? I'll say, I'm going to the edge of the city to jump off. I said, I just can't do this anymore. I'm a terrible Bible teacher, I'll tell her. And she'll go, come home, I've got lunch. And I always do because I went to the edge of the city once, and it's not very far when you jump off, and I don't think, I probably wouldn't even sprain an ankle, so I just quit doing that. But there have been times where I've looked at my ministry and I've just said, you know, this is a season of no fruit. I'm going to go back to fixing cars. And thank God that he doesn't ever let me quit. But can you imagine Jeremiah? 40 years. Do you think he ever prayed and said to the Lord, did you mean another Jeremiah or something like that, Lord? Uh, did I like intercept your word that was supposed to go to someone else? Because I've been doing what you've been telling me for all these years and I have not seen one person get saved. I have not seen my nation repent. In fact, at the end of all this, he writes the book of Lamentations where I believe it's five chapters of him weeping over the fall of Jerusalem. It's interesting, we see Jesus doing that just before 
He's arrested and crucified. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, the one that killed the prophets, how I longed to gather you to myself like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not have it. And then he prophesies of what would happen in 70 AD when another group came into Jerusalem and conquered it and destroyed the city, the Romans. So Jeremiah is called the 11th hour prophet, and he's the author the inhabitants of Judah are the primary audience. The atmosphere is the post-revival era of Judah just before the Babylonian captivity, and that brings us to the agenda. This is what the book is about. And we're going to actually leave chapter 1, and we're going to go to chapter 5. So just flip to the very end of chapter 5. It's verse 31. The moral condition of Judah in the days of Jeremiah is just so clearly described to us by Jeremiah here in chapter 531. And he says here, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? And so... To use modern words, what Jeremiah is saying, because the government was a little bit different in ancient Judah than the government of the United States today, but I'll take our terms so that we can kind of relate to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is saying the politicians are corrupt, the preachers are corrupt, and they're leading the people astray, and the people being self-deceived like it. Now, I can't think of any nation on the face of the earth that that reflects right now, but maybe you can think of one. I mean, Jeremiah, he just, he cries out and he says, okay, the, the, the men that are supposed to lead the country in the civil realm, they're corrupt. The men that are supposed to lead the country in the spiritual realm, they're corrupt, and the people can't even figure it out. Want to know Why? Because the Babylonians were at the door and the politicians and the priests were saying, you got nothing to worry about. Nothing's going to happen here. God told me that the Babylonians are just going to go away. And Jeremiah goes, no, that's not what God told Isaiah or any of the other prophets. It's not what God told me. And they said, Jeremiah, we don't want to listen to you. It, it now has been 50 years at this point that we just read about in chapter 5, verse 31 that blasphemous insults to God were heaped up by kings, by priests, and by the people of Judah. And now, as we get to the book of Jeremiah, the climax has now been reached, and Judah's doom is irrevocably sealed. There's no turning back right now. And it's into this political and moral turmoil that God sent Jeremiah to be his spokesman. Now, I'll make a few comments and then we'll start drawing this to a close. But one of the key words in Jeremiah, it appears in 13 different passages and it's the word backsliding. And it's where I got the series title for Jeremiah this time through. We're calling it Messages to a Backsliding Nation. 13 different passages in Jeremiah use the phrase backsliding. And then another key word that appears in this book 11 different, in 11 different passages, is the word repent. And so when we talk about the agenda, because of what we just talked about with the priests and the kings and the political leaders and the people, Jeremiah says to this nation, you're backsliding. You were once a nation that was committed to God. You had a covenant relationship with God. And now you are backsliding and you need to repent. And as we go through, even beginning next week, we're going to see that the nation had turned their back on the Lord, and they were following false prophets who led them to worship idols. And Jeremiah's task wasn't going to be easy because he had to sound the death knell for his nation. And here in the first part of the book, Jeremiah is going to give several sermons they're given in Jerusalem to the Jewish people, and he gently and lovingly at first begins to denounce the people 
and the priests and the princes for their sins, especially for the sin of idolatry. And as we get further and further into the book, Jeremiah gets less and less gentle. He begins getting a lot more fierce because we're getting closer and closer to judgment. In chapter 25, he announces that the nation is going to go into captivity for 70 years. You, you realize that in Deuteronomy, we learned that because they didn't let the land rest, they were going to have to pay God back. Jeremiah is the one who comes and tells us how long the captivity is going to be. He says it's going to be 70 years, and at the end, he says God is going to give you a new start. God is going to send you back to the land, and you're going to start all over. It's, you know, you're going to get a mulligan, so to speak. And then when we get to chapter 31, Jeremiah is going to prophesy about a new covenant between Jehovah and his people. And he's going to make it very clear. He says this isn't going to be a covenant written on tablets of stone. It's not going to be about you guys keeping the rules. He says, this is going to be a covenant that's written on the hearts of men. And then in the final chapters of the book, Jeremiah deals with the Gentile nations around Judah and tells of God's plan for them. This is so like, I think, what America needs to hear now, because we're going to see that Judah was a key player in international affairs during their time. And who's a key player in the international affairs of this world? Us. Sometimes for good and sometimes we stick our nose where it doesn't belong. But that's so much like us. And that's what I'm saying. Jeremiah is such a perfect study for those of us living in America in the year 2021. So Jeremiah is the author. Judah's the audience. Backsliding is the atmosphere. A call to repentance is the agenda. And we're going to close by giving application, but first, I want to look at verses 11 through 19, where God gives the confirmation of Jeremiah's call. And listen, um, just a second. Yeah, I think we're going to finish early tonight. It's, we've never done that before. So I'll just keep talking, and it won't happen. <laughs> but let me just say something. Um, I've had the privilege of serving in pastoral ministry for... A long time, full full time, uh, where this has been my vocation for about 23 years now. But for about seven years before that, I was ordained as a pastor, and I was serving in a pastoral role while I was bivocational. I don't even want to say bivocational. I worked a, re, a, a, a secular job, and I served in the church on a volunteer basis. And one of the things that I've learned, and I had to learn this the hard way is that the only people that will survive ministry are people that are called to ministry. And I don't necessarily mean full-time paid pastoral ministry. I mean any kind of ministry. The only way you will survive ministry is to be called to ministry. That's why sometimes we see that model of a guy who just, you know, he, he gets out of high school, and he does a few years in college. He goes, man, I don't know what to do, but I've always liked the church. Maybe I'll be a pastor. And he goes to seminary and he gets his degrees and then he goes and he begins serving in churches or on the mission field or whatever he does and, you know, 10 years later, he's selling cars or he's doing construction or he's something. You, you say, hey, what happened? You know, Man, that was not for me. That was not for me at all. And, and you have to ask the question, how, how can it not be for you? And what you'll find is that a lot of men will just be honest. They'll say, this was my choice. This was not a call. This was me making a career move. And what God is about to say to Jeremiah is he's going to say, you're going to survive ministry. And the reason you're going to survive ministry is because I have called you to this. And when you are called by God to ministry and you know you're called, when you're driving to the edge of the city to jump off, there's that little voice in the back of your head just saying, get over yourself, put on a pot of coffee, and go prepare the next Bible study, and get back to work. Well, yeah, but I just had a counseling session with somebody, Lord, and they were mean to me. Well, they were mean to Jesus. I called you to this. Get back to work. And God is going to say this to Jeremiah up front because 
A few chapters in, I think Jeremiah is going to be like, you know, Lord, I'd be a great car salesman. And the Lord is going to go, go back and read chapter one. So this is the confirmation of Jeremiah's call. And in these verses, what God's going to do is give Jeremiah two visions. And these visions confirm his call. He's a prophet, so God might as well speak in the realm of visions and such. So the first vision is in verses 11 and 12, and it's going to focus on the nature of Jeremiah's message. Read verse 11 with me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Now, that makes all the sense in the world, and we can just go on, right? This is, this is where some deep study is required. What God's doing here is God's using a play on Hebrew words to give Jeremiah a confirmation of what he's doing. Notice the subject here is an almond tree. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I, I see a branch of an almond tree. The word for almond tree in Hebrew is shakad, which comes from another word that means to awaken or to watch. In English, it doesn't make any sense at all. In Hebrew, it works out perfectly. This word means to awake or to watch. And then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. And so the almond tree in Palestine is the first to bloom every year. In fact, it blooms in late January, long before any of the other trees in Palestine begin to bud or to bear fruit. The branch of the olive tree represents God here, and he's using this play on Hebrew words to say to Jeremiah, I'm wide awake, and I see everything. There is nothing that I don't see, and I'm watching very closely that my word will come to pass. And so he's assuring Jeremiah, listen, I'm going to give you my word, but it's not your job to make my word come to pass. It's just your job to speak my word to the people. God says, I'll make it come to pass. So in English, you read something like this and you go, what? But as you get into the Hebrew words, you realize it's a play on word. It's, it's God saying, as the tree wakes up, as the tree is, is there, God says, I'm awake and I'm watching. And Jeremiah, all you have to do is speak my word, but I am watching to make sure that my word comes to pass. And you know what? That's, that is such a great word to me because my entire life revolves around studying and presenting the word of God. And every once in a while, Again, I go home and I tell Kelly, I studied so hard and this is what everybody looked like tonight. And then I'm reminded, it's just my job to present the word. And I guess if I don't present it well, well then, you know, God can speak to me on that. But sometimes people will say to me, gosh, Pastor Randy, the other night when you said this, man, I mean, it, I, I just really needed to hear that. And I go back and listen to the message. I did not say that. Those words did not come out of my mouth. The Holy Spirit filter between my mouth and someone else's ears got the word of God across on a subject that we weren't even covering. And, and this happens all the time. And this is God saying, if you will simply bring the word to people, God says, I promise I'm watching and I will bring it to pass. So just be faithful. When, when people approach you and they say, hey, I know you're a Christian, could you... Could you pray for me? I got this going on. Give them some word. Just pray for them, but, but take a minute and say, listen, there's a portion of scripture. I just want to read this to you. Let God work through his word. He is watching to do that. The second vision is in verses 13 through 16, and it focuses on Jeremiah's mission and his message. Let's read all of this. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot, and it's facing away from the north. And then the Lord said to me, out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. 
For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come, and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls and around, and against all the cities of Judah. I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of of their own hands. And God says to Jeremiah, he says, listen, because the inhabitants of Judah have continued to ignore the warnings of the prophets and they've continued to worship other gods, God says, I I am bringing the Babylonian army from the north. And that's that boiling pot that's tipping over. And people will argue and say, well, wait, Babylon was from the east. But if you look at how Babylon came to Judah, they came from the east to the west, and then from the north, they came straight down and they conquered as they went, bringing allies with them. They camped outside the gate, and then they conquered. Like, just, you just read these verses and you go, oh yeah, that's the Babylonians coming with some of their allies and just conquering Judah. It, it's so clear, and God says, Jeremiah, this is going to be your message and this is going to be your ministry. Is that you're going to tell the people that they've ignored my word, they've ignored the warnings, and the boiling pot from the north is going to be poured out. There's no turning back from this. And it's interesting because if you go and you read Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 2 and 3, the fulfillment of verses 13 through 16 that we just read are in those verses. You'll get to see the uh, siege and the fall of Jerusalem. And I want you to see that, that Judah's fall to Babylon would be God's judgment for abandoning him and for her idolatry. In forsaking God and worshiping what their hands had made, the people of Judah had violated their covenant with God. You can look at Deuteronomy 28 to see that. And the sin of Judah brought about her own downfall. Listen, America, we need to read these words and we need to remember that we still have an opportunity to turn back to the Lord, to repent. Um, But if you study the judgment of God, oftentimes the first step of national judgment is where God just simply turns a people over to their wicked hearts and their wicked desires. Uh, theologians call it abandonment, abandonment judgment. You read about it in Romans chapter 1, where God says, you know, Paul says God just gave them over. And I fear that America has gotten to the point where we are either in or on the verge of abandonment judgment. It's where the judgment of God just comes in the form that he says, okay, you guys want you know, rampant sexual immorality and and you want to pursue idolatry with all these things that you just have to have and the riches and everything else, God says, okay, I'll, I'll give you over that. And then what happens is the natural consequences of a nation pursuing those things leads them to the next step of judgment. And I don't want our nation judged that way, do you? I don't want my kids and grandkids growing up in that should the Lord tarry, although my faith is in the rapture of the church. So, These two visions outline Jeremiah's call. And the chapter ends with God charging Jeremiah to take up the challenge. So verses 17 through 19, this is what I want you to picture here. It's like God speaking to Jeremiah and he says, okay, listen, you heard my call, right? Yes, sir. You know it's not going to be easy. Yes, sir. You know what I'm calling you to do. Yes, sir. Now God says, okay, I'm going to give you this charge to take up the challenge now, Jeremiah. And he says here in verse 17, he says, well, therefore, since I've called you and you know you're called, he says, prepare yourself and arise. I'm going to stop there for a minute, give an illustration. In the New Testament, Peter used a phrase where he said to gird up the loins of your mind, right? Another translation says, prepare yourself for action. This is a word picture because men didn't wear pants in those days. They wore those long flowing robes, right? And let's just say you're hanging out with your friends and, you know, everything's good. And a couple of guys walk down the street and they say, hey, we're going to rob you, right? And so all you and your friends, you guys would all reach down and you'd grab the bottom of your robe and you'd wrap it around. Now you're wearing shorts and you're ready to fight. 
or you're ready to run, or you're ready to do whatever you've got to do. And this is the word that God uses with Jeremiah. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. Prepare yourself for action. Remove what's going to trip you up. Do what you've got to do to be successful in this call that I've given you, and arise. So Jeremiah's going, so this isn't all just hypothetic, right? This isn't, I'm just going to read a book on ministry. You're actually going to send me out there. Yeah, arise. It's time to go. He says, speak to them all that I command you. Give them the whole counsel of God's word. Don't be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. Well, we'll just pause there for a minute. He says, Jeremiah, listen, I'm going to give you some hard messages. You've got to give them all of the word. You can't pull any punches. And he says, you know, if you're embarrassed of me and the righteousness that I'm calling you to preach, Jeremiah, you're going to find yourself embarrassed by me. Don't be embarrassed of me, because if you're embarrassed of me, you're going to end up being embarrassed by me. Verse 18, for behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, And against the people of the land, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. So God basically says to Jeremiah, this is going to be a hard call, but listen. He says, I want you to think of yourself as a fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls. He says, because everybody's going to be against you, but I'm going to make you stand. And he says here, that they won't prevail. God says, I'm with you, and I love this last part. He says, I will deliver you. So, so Jeremiah, there's going to be times where you think the ministry is going to cost you your life. He says, but Jeremiah, I'm, I'm going to deliver you. So let's close now with, with the application. Our four A's we've gone through, the author, the audience, the atmosphere, the agenda, now let's just talk a little bit of application. And I think this is, this is national. This is for you and I as 21st century Americans. As we study the book of Jeremiah, our nation is in the exact place that Judah was just before God judged her. We've turned away from God. We've chased idols. The things that God said not to do, we've made national policy and protected with laws and that kind of stuff. That's exactly where Judah was at just before God judged her. I think as a nation, we were once committed to our relationship with God. Our our money even says one nation under God. Our constitution is built for a God-loving people. But we're now in a post-revival season of rebellion. I think the last real revival that we've seen here in the United States started in the late 60s and ran into maybe the early 80s. And um, we need a revival in our nation. I think that's what we need. What we're seeing in our land is the same as in Judah. High-ranking politicians are corrupt. Many well-followed preachers are preaching feel-good messages instead of teaching the Word of God And many of our citizens, even those who claim the name of God, choose to hide their faces from what's really going on because they're experiencing the prosperity that our nation has been experiencing for a long time, and they don't want to lose it. And then into this backsliding, God sent Jeremiah. Well, here in America, who is God going to send into the backsliding of our nation? It's you and I. It's the church. God sends his church with a message very similar to Jeremiah's. And I love, we'll start seeing it next week, Jeremiah starts out so gentle. He, he wasn't, you know, just walking up to people and poking them in the chest and saying, you're going to die and go to hell. He began trying to woo them back the way that God woos us. And I think the church needs to remember that we're dealing with people and we've got to be careful how we reach people. We have to reach them with truth. But we've got to really rethink how we're reaching people. We need to go into the world and be able to say, re- repent and return to God and be restored. But I do think we need to rethink how we package that message so that people might pay attention to it. And I'm just going to say that even as that was coming out of my mouth, I just draw a big blank. 
have no idea. But over the, over the centuries, God has taught people how to package the message in a way that people will receive it. Um, I don't think the guy standing on the corner in a three-piece suit and a tie 100 degrees outside in a South Carolina summer holding a sign that says, hell is hot, I don't think that's going to work the way it might have worked at one time. So we need to teach people the word. It's the word that transforms lives. So God's calling us to do the same thing he called Jeremiah to do. Judah refused to repent, and they faced judgment, but I believe there's still hope for the USA, and I hope you believe that too, because if you don't have that hope, you won't go to action. But if we have that hope, we'll be people of action. So let's close Look up at the screen, or you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. Most of you probably have this memorized. But I think that these are the marching orders as we walk out of here, having read and studied chapter 1 of Jeremiah. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good, excuse me, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Church, how's our salt? Salt purifies, salt burns, but salt makes people thirsty. Verse 14, you're the light of the world. A city that sits on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How's your light? Is it shining in the darkness? If it's not, um, the second week of 2022 might be a great time to give the lamp a little tune-up and get that light shining because as people see us living for the Lord, it creates in them a desire, I want that. And sometimes they communicate it the way they communicated to Jeremiah. They start with hate and persecution, but deep down inside they're saying, I want what you want. Help me find it. So, Father, tonight, thank you so much for Jeremiah. Forty years of fruitless ministry. Forty years of being faithful one day at a time, one trial at a time, one persecution at a time. He never experienced people flocking to him to be their pastor or to lead them to the Lord but he fought every day to keep his relationship with you strong, to keep his faith strong, and he served you despite everything that came his way. Lord, I closed on Sunday challenging the church that we would be Daniels. We would be men of integrity who do the right thing the right way. Lord, tonight I pray that we would hear this challenge to be Jeremiah's, to be in it for the long game, to set our sights on the finish line and to run at a pace that assures that we're going to hit that finish line running. And and so, Lord, if anybody in the room tonight needs to do any business with you, if if we need to get things out of our lives that are hindering us from the call. Lord, if we've got things going on in our lives that are keeping us from being salt and light, or we've got things going on that are going to at some point disqualify us from continuing, Father, just speak so clearly to us that we could call those things sin, we could repent and we could stop the backsliding and we could move forward. Because I believe, Lord, that our nation depends on the church right now. If the church doesn't get serious about following you and sharing what's coming, then, Lord, our nation has no hope. But Jesus is our hope. And I pray, Lord, that Jesus would send a revival to the United States of America. And maybe it'll start here in the South. Maybe it'll start in the upstate of South Carolina. Because a group of people at Calvary Chapel were praying and seeking you and allowing you to work. Lord, we pray, bring revival. Bring it to us. Bring it through us, Lord. But bring it and save our nation. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. our feet on the rock.
In you alone, and I. 